I'm Dan kurtz and this is the Foreign Affairs Interview. When Putin was uh, sending a signal that politics is not for you, politics is our realm, people accepted it eagerly. Even for an autocrat like Vladimir Putin, waging war depends on the acceptance, if not the support, of his people. Despite the disastrous start to his invasion of Ukraine, despite battlefield losses and mounting casualties, Russian approval of the war remains remarkably high. Masha Littman, a Russian journalist and political scientist who fled her country when the war began, explains how Putin has managed to sustain support for his war effort. And she warns that there is little reason to think that will change anytime soon. Masha, welcome to the Foreign Affairs Interview. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me. So I, I want to get to the prospects for Russia and for Vladimir Putin and for U.S.-Russian relations during and after the war in Ukraine in the course of this conversation, um, especially to what you in a recent foreign affairs piece called Wartime Putinism. But I want to I want to start much earlier, um, going back to I think a more hopeful time for Russia, for Russians, for Russia's role in the world, one that you were very much a part of as a journalist and editor and as a, a chronicler and analyst of the country's course. You've written a lot about the bargain that Vladimir Putin made with the Russian people at the start of his rule more than 20 years ago. That followed a decade of chaos and instability that had come after the, the fall of the Soviet Union. Going back to the 1990s, what, what is your diagnosis of what went wrong with the course Russia was on? Where did Russian democracy especially go wrong? And was it really doomed from the start or were there moments could, when it could have gone on another course? I would say it was probably doomed. Maybe doomed is too hard a word, but I don't think in retrospect there was a real chance for Russia to evolve as what? As a Western democracy? What kind of Western democracy as the US, as Britain, as France, as Germany, as whatever? Russia is uh, a large country, the largest country in the world, a difficult country, a complicated country, and the chances of Russia evolving as uh, very naive hopes circulated at the time was indeed something that was not justified. I wouldn't say that I was just so insightful at the time. I too had my hopes. But in retrospect, I think what happened, maybe not exactly the dynamic, not exactly the timing, but that Russia did not end up as a Western democracy. It could have been predicted easily. What did you, you were a you were a, uh, an editor at the time? What did you make of Putin when he first came to office, and and what did you make of the the what the offering that he was uh, he brought to the Russian people at that point? With my background of a Moscovite a member of liberal intelligentsia, Putin was a person who made me actually very highly concerned. He is passed uh, in the KGB. The fact that he did not share the hopefulness, the dreams associated with the collapse of the Communist Party, he was not with his people at the time, with those millions of people in the Soviet Union who actually were rejoicing seeing the dictatorship of the Communist Party fall apart. He had a different background, different perception, and that made me very seriously concerned. Many people around me were under the illusion or maybe wanted to believe that uh, Putin was a reformer. And indeed he was, especially as far as the Russian economy was concerned. But his political instincts were, I think, unmistakable even back then. You've described um, what you call a no participation pact um, between Putin's Kremlin and the Russian public that worked pretty well for, for the, fir the first several years. He brought a degree of stability, a degree of, of economic growth, and in exchange expected political demobilization. And that formula seemed to serve him well for a period of time. It is common to describe the bargain or pact, uh, however, whichever uh, word you use, as freedom for prosperity, that people sacrificed freedom for prosperity. I think it's a bit of an oversimplification. And I also see the pact, of course, quote unquote pact, as actually people surrendering responsibility for policy making because they wanted to, because they were sick and tired of seeing the country in turmoil. 
different politicians, political struggle, which actually did not bring about prosperity or anything positive to the country in their perception. So they surrendered responsibility willingly. When Putin was uh, sending a signal that politics is not for you, politics is our realm, people accepted it eagerly. And this is how I think it shouldn't be described as a bargain. Also, this quote-unquote pact, in my perception, can be seen as three-pronged. Putin's pact with the wealthy was you can go on enriching yourselves. And actually, Putin and the Russian oligarchs were very lucky with high and growing oil prices. So go on enriching yourself. We will look the other way as you using not necessarily savory ways of uh, enriching yourselves. But don't mess up with politics. And if we ask you to share your wealth, please oblige. The fact with the masses, with the majority of Russians, was we will deliver and we expect you to vote for us in elections. And finally, the third prong, the pact with educated urbanites, liberals, however you call them, people to whom things like freedoms were important, the Kremlin actually offered a rather high degree of freedom, but the freedom uh, that was limited to preaching to the converted, to preaching to the choir. You can have your own media, you can criticize us in our media, but please, we do not want you to stir unwanted sentiments among the broad population. This is for yourselves. And indeed, it was, uh, you know, it was not a bad life at all. And some uh, of uh, the Russian journalists even remember the time, the first decade of Putin's tenure, as a very good time for the media. They had loyal audiences, the audiences that were like minded, actually made enough money for a comfortable lifestyle. So all three, all three prongs, all three different constituencies had a reason to be satisfied. Basically, the message for all three was don't mess up with politics. And that was okay for all three, except for very, very few who still wanted to play a role in politics and to uh, to play a role in policymaking. So it worked very well. The government delivered. The government actually offered a reasonable degree of freedom to those who wanted it and who were interested. Stability and prosperity was what the government delivered. And, uh, you know, I can't imagine a country in which the vast constituency would not be happy to have prosperity growing and the things getting stable instead of chaotic as they were in the previous decade. So why did that start to come apart? Was it changes in the underlying conditions? Was it something about Putin that changed? I would say the turning point was the end of 2011 at the time when Putin decided that he wanted to come back. There were four years at the end of the previous decade uh, when Putin stepped down from his position of the president and anointed his very loyal associate, Dmitry Medvedev, as president and himself took the position of the prime minister. It is important to remember that the liberals who actually had a degree of freedom, used that time for social modernization. And by the end of the decade, there was actually a rising interest in politics as well. Not only did those people start all kinds of civic projects and gain skills, but they also were developing slowly some degree of interest in politics. So when Putin and Medvedev, Medvedev, of course, this proxy, proxy president, announced that they would trade places, that Putin was returning to presidency and Medvedev would be made his prime minister, there was quite some outrage. And many people in Russia felt insulted that the two men would decide the issue of who has the ultimate power in the country between themselves instead of with the people. This was preceded or about the same time, actually in December 2011, we had a parliamentary election in Russia which was especially rigged. So the combination of uh, a rigged election and this growing sense of we actually can make a difference too. We are actually also interested in politics. This brought about a large, well, rather large scale, I would say, uh, political protests, first and foremost in Moscow, but also in quite a few large urban centers 
in Moscow at the peak of uh, that protest season, we had 100,000 people in the streets chanting, Putin go, Putin is a thief, and such kind of chants. So that was actually a turning point. And I would point out that it was the liberals, the educated urbanized, the modernized Russians who actually broke their part of the pact. Because the pact was you don't mess up with politics. Self-expression is fine in your media, in your civic projects, but politics is ours. Politics belongs to the Kremlin. So they were in breach of the pact. And of course, in response, Putin broke his part of that pact as well, big time. So that was when the Kremlin started to crack down on non-governmental media, on any kind of political activism became intolerable, and even civic activism was under suspicion. And from then on, actually, things grew worse and worse, and the government cracked down harder and harder. This was also accompanied uh, with the deterioration of relations with the West. Putin has always been suspicious of the West. However, he wanted cooperation. He wanted a cooperation that would uh, be beneficial for Russia. And he himself contributed to that by meeting with important entrepreneurs, Western businessmen, etc. But he always was suspicious of the West somehow interfering in an undesired way in the minds of the Russian people and uh, in Russian domestic life. And here, I think the the turning point almost coincided with the season of protests that began in December 2011. And the turning point, I think, was the events in Libya, which Putin regarded as a betrayal of the West, as a uh, moment when the West actually took advantage of Russia abstaining in the UN Security Council when the Western coalition was about to launch its operation in Libya. Putin believed, and I think he was right, that the coalition went farther than the Russian abstention mandated. And he saw that as a betrayal. And also he was horrified at what happened to Gaddafi, the kind of murder, uh, grisly murder that was shown on television. Anyway, I think that was, and it was almost the same time. So when the first large crowds appeared in the streets of Moscow, and the first one had about 30,000 people chanting, Putin was a thief and Putin should go. Putin's very first reaction was that it was Hillary Clinton who inspired the protesters in Moscow. He did not repeat that afterwards, but it was, I think, his immediate reaction. This couldn't have evolved uh, by itself. It is evidence that the West is interfering with Russian affairs in a way that Putin saw as inadmissible. So it's a couple of years later in 2014 that Putin takes Crimea and starts the war in eastern Ukraine and the Donbass that, you know, the war that continues today in Bakhmut and elsewhere. I think it's really interesting to look at this moment in the context of that turning point a couple of years earlier that you talked about, this moment when the, I'm trying to avoid using the word bargain or pact, but the arrangement that had worked for Putin through those first years of his time in power, it started to come apart. In Crimea, as you write about it, allows him a new purchase, right? a new moment to kind of be seen as a unifier and inspire pride in, in the Russian people. Why was that such a, an essential moment for him when, when he took Crimea? Well, I think uh, first has to be emphasized just how immensely important Ukraine has always been to Putin. I would cite just one example, but a very important one. When at the parliamentary election in Ukraine, earlier than the time that you've been talking about, uh, the competition was between a pro-Moscow, Viktor Yanukovych, and a pro-Western, this is an oversimplification, but still I think they can be portrayed this way, uh, Viktor Yushchenko and Putin personally campaigned. I cannot find another word. He personally campaigned for Viktor Yanukovych, and Viktor Yanukovych lost. To Putin, it was a... An immense shock. And uh, this, I think, was pretty obvious from the way he talked about it, from the way he tried to somehow see this as a victory anyway, being based on exit polls uh, instead of the actual results. Anyway, there was every evidence that to Putin it was a vital event and he lost. 
And then gradually, uh, Viktor Yushchenko lost popularity. Viktor Yanukovych won. So Putin basically had his man in Ukraine, who turned out to be not a very reliable partner. But anyway, he had his man. He was, he was vindicated. I'm skipping the details, but when uh, in Maidan revolution, the revolution of destiny, took place in Ukraine, Putin was thrown back to square one. Once again, despite all his effort, is personally investing in Ukrainian politics, and despite spending a lot of money on Ukraine, he was back to square one with Ukraine having a pro-Western figure at the helm and a more radical one than Ryushchenko was. So he had to do something about it to prevent this extremely untoward course of events. And that was when he annexed Crimea. And indeed, you know, uh, after the protest in Moscow, Putin emerged as a divider in his uh, nation. He and the Kremlin condemned the uh, protesters as un-Russian, unpatriotic. There was a clear desire to say that there are good Russians and un-Russian Russians So he acted as a divider, but the annexation of Crimea not only was a move that he took to prevent the unthinkable, to prevent something that was totally unacceptable to him, uh, another pro-Western government and radical pro-Western government in Ukraine, but also it enabled him to re-emerge as a uniter, the uniter that he was during his first decade in power when the government was not very repressive, didn't crack down the way it did later, uh, when, you know, the time of prosperity and stability. He lost that after the protest. He regained the same image of a uniter after Crimea because uh, the annexation of Crimea was very broadly accepted and hailed in Russia and seen as a moment of Russia's grand victory, actually the first grand victory of Russia since uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union. Everything that the Russians took pride in, such as the victory in World War II, was before. It uh, It was back in the Soviet Union. So it was a first very big victory, very significant to the Russian people, And on top of that, a victory that did not cost anything to the Russian people in terms of human lives or economically, certainly not at the time. It was instant. It was basically bloodless. And it was, it can be seen as a present of the president to his people. It was Putin's achievement, not the people's. And uh, he was totally, you know, glorified for that. And his approval rating at the time almost reached 90 percent. Jumping forward a few years, I want to go to the weeks and months ahead of the invasion that started on February 24th of last year. What was the mood inside of Russia in, let's say, late 2021 and early 2022? Was there a a sense that the war was coming? Was there any sense that Russians were focused on it, supported it, invested in it? What do we know of the public opinion and what was the mood like at that point? Well, the Russian people, just like almost anyone in the world, uh, did not expect that there would be war. Despite the fact that there were uh, there was an accumulation of troops at the border, but I wouldn't blame the Russian people for that. Very, very few political analysts, very savvy political analysts, actually believed and said so that there would be a real war, and a uh, 20th century war at that. So no, there was no anticipation of uh, a war, but there was certainly a rise in anti-Western sentiments. Propaganda worked at least ever since the annexation of Crimea. And even before that, there was the sense that was rather broad in Russia that the West is there to do harm to us. But to that should be added that since 2014, there was also a sense that we can stand up for ourselves. The West is certainly a force for evil. Uh, It was certainly uh, unfriendly, hostile, but we are strong. We rose from our knees. The war came, of course, as a shock, and it came as a shock to everyone. So not anticipated, but at least one aspect of of that war, of this war, was there even before the actual military operation began. The element that is extremely important now, because the war in Russia is very broadly seen as the war against the West. Uh, against NATO, against the United States. And that had been there 
before the actual military operation began. And you've described this effort that Putin made to attack first, and I'm quoting you here, only then attempting to mobilize Russian society. He kind of expected a level of demobilization. And again, quoting you, he built a barrier between the war and everyday life. How well did that work in the early months of the war? I think it worked pretty well. And actually, it was clear. I remember as early as in May when uh, I was giving a talk and I said that uh, it is hard, it may be hard to believe it, but this war is seen as a distant war in Russia. It's something that this, of course, was before the actual military mobilizations that began in, uh, in the fall. To uh, switch from a demobilized society, a society of people who are pushed away from policymaking, policy is not your business, policy is ours, to something that would be a mobilized society would have actually radically changed the very pattern of governance that Putin introduced. And he tried to avoid it as much as possible and much longer than it was even expedient from a military point of view. So hence, the war is referred as a uh, special military operation, not a war. Still today, one year after into a monstrous, atrocious war with gigantic and abominable toll of casualties, still this is not a war. And actually calling it a war is a crime in Russia. So why special military operation? Well, because special military operation is done by somebody, the military, not us, not us Russians. Uh, And it worked. And after the initial shock, uh, when it turned out that nothing special, nothing dramatic is uh, interfering with our lives, the lives of uh, the majority of Russians, people came to regard this war as something distant, something that didn't have to do with, with their lives. So this acquiescence, not ardent support, not passionate warmongering. That was what Putin, what Putin's Kremlin needed, acquiescence. You accept it and you may go on with your business. The other center, the remaining uh, non-governmental polling agency, asks this question every month. Do you follow closely the uh, developments of the military, special military operation? Of course, they do not call it a war either. And the last result in February was 25%. Just a quarter of people, uh, when asked, what are the memorable events of the previous months? It is, of course, the most uh, commonly remembered event, but 25%. In January, it was 31. Early in the year, it was a higher number, but people are losing interest in the war to the extent that they can pretend or they can withdraw into their into their uh, private lives. And of course, it helps that, you know, the war has reached a phase when uh, the developments have stalled, not much is going on, not much mo- military movement. So people go on with their, with their lives. And when asked, they will say they support, a majority do. But it is not that, uh, you know, they get up in the morning and go to bed in the evening thinking about Russian soldiers, Russian men who are being killed, or, you know, just how successful the military operation has been. They are in support. They are not against. The number of those who are against is not high. And what is very important... um, mm, and we use this expression with Michael Water at, uh, in the Foreign Affairs article, Michael Kimmich, uh, people are anti-anti-war, which means that they may not be ardently supportive, but they certainly do not approve of anti-war activists who they see as dangerous troublemakers and as traitors because, you know, the war is us against them and you do not support the enemy. Of course you don't. We'll be back after a short break. Multiple forces are shaping the world economy today. Commodity prices have moderated, but Russia's war in Ukraine grinds on as geopolitical tensions mount. Elevated inflation rates are raising the cost of living in many countries, and high debt levels limit government's ability to address climate change and digitalization, pushing some closer to default. And though many economies are gradually recovering, COVID-19 continues to cause widespread outbreaks. 
From April 10th through 16th, 190 member countries will convene at the IMF World Bank Group 2023 Spring Meetings to find ways to act decisively and act together to build a more resilient world. Join the conversation by visiting meeting.imf.org. You are among the hundreds of thousands of Russians, I suppose, who chose to leave around the time the war began. Was that a straightforward decision, even if a wrenching one? And how, how do you see others around you grappling with, with that decision to leave or stay? It was an extremely abrupt decision for my family. And uh, um, my husband and I and our daughter's family left together, the six of us, uh, with two little ones, our grandchildren, I uh, could never imagine that I would take just such a crucial decision so instantly. You know, I've lived in Russia long enough to remember the uh, waves of immigration, one of uh, 1970s when I was uh, still very young, and the other in early 1990s. Uh, Lots and lots and lots of people around me, people I knew very well, especially the 70s, my close friends emigrated, and I decided against it. And I never regretted it when things began to change for better in my country and uh, our wildest dreams were coming through with the collapse of the Communist Party, etc. So, you know, of course, we were talking about it with friends who emigrated and friends who stayed and you know, after so many years, so many decades, I knew that I would never leave because I because I haven't when I was younger. And then suddenly, in a matter of literally a few hours, we got up and went with just a few, a few bags and leaving behind our apartment in which we lived for forty years, our books. You know, it is uh, you know uh, an indispensable element of any Moscow intellectual department. Lots and lots of books uh, that we accumulated over the years. My husband is an academic, so even more books. Uh, we just locked the door and went. Was that prompted by fear or by a desire not to be acquiescent in that same way? I realize those aren't entirely separable, but for us, it was. You know, the immediate emotional reaction, we cannot stay in the country that is waging a monstrous war on its neighbor. Just the impossibility, it was almost physical. You know, so many people describe those first days and hours um, after uh, the war began in physical terms. You just couldn't do anything. You were in a state of shock. And I uh, have to admit that it was the same for me. So it was that. Something has to be done. And what is there to be done? Just leave. I can only imagine um, how that decision would feel, especially in, in in that kind of timeline. But to go back to the, you know, kind of acquiescence of of all those who stayed, is wartime Putinism sustainable for Putin? Is this a situation that even with, you know, perspective for the mobilizations and the economic costs have been, I think, less than people thought they might be a year ago, but have still been, uh, you know, not not nothing. Does that start to fray over time? I'm sorry to say uh, the regime looks strong, much stronger than one would think or hope. And... uh, I'm also sorry to say that Putin and his minders, his aides, have heroin to perfection their ways and their tricks that enables uh, uh, that enable them to keep the public in check and the elites, elites in fear, public in check. The way the government went around it, I'm sorry to say again, has been wise. And, uh, you know, when we were leaving or fleeing, a rumor uh, went around that Putin is about was about to uh, announce a state of emergency, and uh, that borders will be closed. So uh, uh, to us, it was like you know the last day, and then doors would be shut and we would be locked inside. However, doors were not locked, borders were not closed. They remain open up until this day. It is not easy to leave for a variety of reasons, but it is possible. So the policy was not to um, lock everyone inside and then have to deal with those who were uh, discontent, but uh, actually encourage them to leave and thereby let off steam 
and then deal with those who chose to stay but still were defiant uh, and brave or, I don't know, maybe insane enough to continue expressing anti-war sentiments. The government has become pretty merciless time, but you can one is still free to leave even today to avoid the uh, prospect of being locked up for many years. The government crackdown has gotten much harder and uh, the jail terms much longer and the treatment overall of those who dare show defiance in public. The treatment has, has grown much harsher. You, you have written in one of your pieces for Foreign Affairs that while it's extremely unlikely that Putin will be able to achieve some kind of you know, acceptable outcome, he very likely could sustain this war indefinitely, that it's been, there's no reason for him to back down, but he can afford to prolong the war and, and pay those costs domestically and economically more or less indefinitely. Is that still, is that still your basic analysis, that he's, he has no real incentive to end this anytime soon? Well, on the one hand, uh, I, I can't believe this war will last indefinitely, certainly not at this pace because uh, both sides are wasting or spending so many human lives. This is not endless. There is a limited number of, of men. And same goes for equipment, for, for uh, materiel, for, for whatever, rockets. Uh, so on the one hand, it cannot go on forever, not at this pace. Uh, uh, it can probably slow down. But since there doesn't seem to be a clear advantage to either of the two sides, and increasingly over months now, military experts have been saying that this war will last much longer. I think there is a potential, there is a capacity for Russia to, to uh, continue this war. And at least at this point, uh, at this point in time, um, public opinion is not an obstacle. Could Putin get away with accepting something short of the, the objectives he laid out early in the war? Could he say, you know, accept a deal where he returns to February 23rd borders and, and you know, uh, maintain the annexation of Crimea and occupation of some of eastern Ukraine, but uh, otherwise withdraw to where things were before this started? Or would that be, would that be a threat to his rule? In a Given the uh, public mood today, I think almost anything can be sold to the people as, if not a victory, but as, a, as an acceptable outcome of the war. And actually, even though some two-thirds um, consistently say that they support the Russian military operation in Ukraine, a rather large number of people say they are in favor of peace talks. So I think as far as uh, people at large are concerned, they will not be a problem as they haven't been a problem uh, in this war. I want to end on a somewhat different note along with much else. You are the regular review of of books on on Russia for foreign affairs, which means that at least for the few years you've seen uh, probably every book published in English on on the subject. So I, I wanted to end by asking you about books. If someone wants to read three or four or five books to understand Putin's Russia, what would be at the top of your list? You know, I'm a bit skeptical about books about uh, about Putin's Russia, which uh, can explain everything. There have been, uh, over the years, uh, lots of brilliant books, but, you know, Russia, the way Russia has evolved was not expected ever by anyone. But as I've been reading for several years now, you know, five books uh, for every, uh, every two months, every issue of the foreign affairs, I found myself more keen and more interested in history books than books about politics. And if I may, I would uh, actually name a few that struck me as uh, just simply extremely interesting. Well, one of the uh, recent ones that I read uh, was a book by Lucy Ward called The Empress and the English Doctor about how the Russian ruler, Catherine the Great, uh, invited a modest uh, British doctor to Russia to uh, go on inoculating uh, her people, beginning with herself, against smallpox. And uh, it was, it can be seen as one of the early steps toward eradication of smallpox in the world. In the context of 
COVID. I think this is a fascinating read that I strongly recommend. Or uh, a slightly earlier book that I reviewed, I think in 2020, by Eleanor Gilbert called To See Paris and Die. A very interesting read, an extremely thorough research of the late Soviet infatuation with the West. An interesting reading today when Russia is at such you know, existential conflict with the West, and it seems inconceivable that, uh, you know, the West would be seen as anything but the enemy in the uh, conceivable future. So infatuation is the word, and uh, that's what, this is what Eleonore uh, Gilbert describes. Or the uh, Juliana first book about Soviet hippies. I think very interesting to uh, the American reader, especially a reader of a certain age who remembers American hippies. I think uh, the book offers so many, uh, so much interesting stuff about this culture in Russia and, and, how, um, and how it evolved, evolved. Just three examples of books that do not help explain Putin's Russia in the least, especially the one about the 18th century but are just interesting read that do not condemn Russia or praise Russia, but just uh, tell a story that is extremely interesting and fascinating and captivating. And uh, uh, it, it has to do with Russia. And I have to think that reading some of that history um, will at least contribute to someone's understanding of Russia today. So I, I appreciate those recommendations. Masha, thank you so much for joining us today and for all of the fantastic work you've done for foreign affairs over the last few years. I suspect we'll continue to uh, to draw on you for much of it, but but th thanks so much for, uh, for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening. You can find the articles that we discussed on today's show at foreignaffairs.com. The Foreign Affairs Interview is produced by Kate Brannon, Julia Fleming Dresser, and Molly McEnany. Special thanks also to Grace Finlayson, Caitlin Joseph, Nora Revenaugh, Asher Ross, Gabrielle Sierra, and Marcus Zacharia. Our theme music was written and performed by Robin Hilton. Make sure you subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you like what you heard, please take a minute to rate and review it. We release a new show every other Thursday. Thanks again for tuning in.